many years now. Satan's trying to stop us. Oh, but the bride of Jesus, Lord, she's still alive. Oh, like a mighty army, she keeps marching on her, winning every battle. Oh, the Lord's on her side, cause we've got the power. Yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Brother Chad prepares to come. Thank you, Lord. Because we've got the power in the name of Jesus. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. Though Satan rages, we cannot be. God bless you. Feels good to be back home. I was only gone for about four days, but it certainly feels good. God bless you, Brother Jariah, Sister Rebecca. It's good to have you back. You've been gone longer than me, but it's good to see you. While we're standing, let's read a scripture, and then we'll let you have your seats. And, and let's go to Psalms 27. Psalms chapter 27, and we'll start reading from verse 1. Psalms 20, 27 and 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore shall I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yeah, I will sing praises unto the Lord. I mean, let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time to be together. Lord, we're so thankful that we get to share this evening together, Lord. And what we're looking for, Lord, is for you to come and speak to us. We've worshipped you, Lord, with our hearts because we love you, and we're asking you now to come down and just break the bread of life to us. Speak your words into our heart, Lord, and change us by your word. We give you preeminence in this place and pray that you would take control. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. You can be seated, friends. Just want to say we appreciate your prayers, praying for us while we were gone. We had a really, really nice time. And it was just amazing, and we just want to say a thank you to Brother Kyle, who took the Sunday service, and poor Brother Kyle was sick and struggling through, but he did what he felt like the Lord was leading him to do and delivered his heart, and it was quite a blessing, and so we thank him for that sacrifice, and also we want to thank uh, Sister Mon and Brother Nate Ball for all the work going into the dinner. God bless you, and they had a lot of helpers, and it was a nice time, my wife told me, and we appreciate everybody who pitched in and helped there. I hate missing the fellowship dinners, but it is what it is. I just want to tell you a little bit about my trip up to Brother Elijah's. I had never been into Connecticut before, so it was my first time. I had actually only been in New England one time, and it was for some training with work years and years ago. And so uh, I, I got up there. I didn't really know anybody there. I don't really know Brother Elijah very well. I met him one time and spoke with him on the phone once or twice, and and so really I was going blind, but I just felt that tug in my heart from the Lord that I should go. And, and so I accepted the invitation and, and I went up there. And uh, they had pulled together several churches. There's a lot of uh, little fellowships there in New England and the, several of them came in together. And so we had a nice time together. But we had an exceptionally good services. We had Sunday morning, Sunday evening service, and they were just over the top, exceptionally good. The response from the people was fantastic, and, and there was a lot of freedom and liberty to preach. And, and the reason I tell you all that is because I, I come to say thank you to all of you guys, because I realized something on this trip more than, than ever before. I realized that, that the people... You and I, when we're sitting pulling on the gift, we actually operate the gift. There's a gift, and the gift God chose different vessels of clay, and he decided before the foundation of the world which vessels were in a house, which gifts, and we all have different gifts. But really, it's the pull of the people that operate the gift. And I realized <clears throat> that we will labor for weeks or a month on a subject here, and I'll just get a little bit of it, and I'll take a step, and and, and I'll study, and you guys pull me further than I was in study. Then I'll go back and study, and then I'll come back and share that. And then you guys will pull me further than I even studied. And so together, we're growing in the revelation of the Lord because you're operating the gift. There's times I come to the pulpit, and I'm surprised at the things that come out of my mouth. And, and I can't wait to get back and write down some things and go and, and study it out. And I realize we take steps every Sunday, every Wednesday, we're taking steps and we're growing together. And then it's really evident when I go out of town because I'll take a month worth of services and I'll cut all the extra content out where I'm trying to find our way in the scriptures and trying to explore this new area. And as truths are established and truths are established, then you go back and you just pull the punchlines out of every service and you stick them together and all of a sudden you have a fantastic time and from beginning to end, it's just off the charts. And it's because we labor together here every Sunday 
and every Wednesday. And sometimes we don't realize the progress we're making until we have a, a, an event like this where I go up and I take what we've been preaching for some time and compile it together into two services, and then you just see the response of the people. And at the end of the second service, the power of God just came down in such a special way. And I mean, literally, I, I just don't even know how to describe it. It was such a literal presence and such an excitement in the people. It felt like that, that the pressure inside was going to blow the doors open or blow the windows open or, or lift the roof off the top. I don't know, but it was very, very exciting. And, and so I just want to say thank you, guys. We appreciate you. And let's just keep laboring together, you and I. And man, I'll do my part. I'll study and I'll prepare because that's my favorite thing in the world to do. But then we all do our part and pull in the gift and, and we all get down this road together. I remember uh, 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 an analogy I had heard some time ago and I, I've used it before, but if you see an old two-man crosscut saw, and they lay a log down, you get two guys on either side and they got this crosscut saw going, you can't work that saw by yourself. Because you can't push that saw. If you push it, it bows. It takes a pull on the other end. Amen. Amen. And then you pull and we pull and we work together until we rightly divide the word of God. But it's a team effort. So we'll take this cross cut saw and ask the Lord by the power of his Holy Ghost to get us to work together and cut this thing down. But it's exciting. And we had a a really wonderful time. While I was there... I realized I was studying on some things that I had brought over the last couple of weeks, and in studying and preparing there, I realized I had made two mistakes, and I probably made more than that, but I realized I made two mistakes. In the last previous Sunday service, when I was talking about the blackout of the moon, when the Pope, uh, Pope Paul VI went into Jerusalem, <clears throat> I said it was in May sometime, but I was wrong. It was December 30th, 1963. So right at the end of the year in 1963 is when there was the actual eclipse and the blackout of the moon. And then Pope Paul VI goes into Israel six days later. He goes into Israel on January the 5th, 1964. So the blackout preceded his time in Israel by six days. I thought that was fascinating as well. So my mistake honed me on on something even more exciting. (laughs) Then the second mistake that I made was I said that the Alaskan earthquake, which I had the date right on that, was March 27th. It was Good Friday, 1964. But I said it was the largest earthquake ever in recorded history, and I was wrong. It's the second largest. The largest earthquake was in 1961 in Chile. It was a 9.5. The one in Alaska was a 9.2. It was the largest earthquake ever in U.S. history. That's where I made my mistake. And it was the largest in the Northern Hemisphere. So I wanted to stand corrected. Now, those are the two that I was aware of. I may have made more mistakes, but if I become aware of them, I'll let you know. Or you can make me aware of them. That's always good for me, too. Humility is a wonderful thing. Anyways, I want to get back to our scripture. If we could pull up the PowerPoint. Brother Franco helped me with the PowerPoint today. I was scribbling out some things on the paper, and I was showing him this thing I was really excited about and drawing some stuff, and he he took my paper, and he made a nice PowerPoint out of it. So I like that. I wish it could really work that way, like you scribble on paper, and you lay it down somewhere, and little fairies or elves take it and turn it into PowerPoints the next day. That would be really good. So Brother Franco was a real help to me. So while I was studying, he was making some of the graphics for this. So I want to go back to Psalms 27 and talk about this for just a minute. In Psalms 27, Brother Branham takes this passage of Scripture and decides to read it as his opening Scripture for the, for the rapture message. We're going to preach the rapture, and, and it, it's interesting that he would choose this. But this is want to pull some, some things out of this. Uh, it was a time of trouble, and in the time of trouble, uh, David's writing that the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? So in this time of trouble, the light and the salvation that came to him took away his fear. And the light and the salvation that's coming to us to this day is to take away our fear. There's nothing for us to be afraid of. Amen. Amen. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
The wicked, even mine enemies, my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. Though a host shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired. So now, now he's, he's telling us about the squeeze. And as the squeeze goes on, as they war against me and as they come up against me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell because they're not going to be able to accomplish their cowardly deed. Just before they're about to do it, he snatches her away. Hallelujah. I just think it's so interesting the way Brother Benham does things like this. Verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And when he says dwell in the house of the Lord, he's not necessarily talking about a house like we talk a house when I go into a house. He's talking about the household or the kingdom or or the whole house, like Abraham's house. He had a tent for his wives and, and he had servants and that was all Abraham's house. Amen. And this is what David's saying, I want to live in the kingdom of the Lord forever, all of my days. I don't want to be outside of that. That I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. This word pavilion means a covert or a hiding place and uh, 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 like in the bushes, someplace that you would go hide. He'll hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. A rock is always in the scriptures typed with revelation. He will set me up upon a rock. What rock do you think he's going to be set upon at the time of the rapture? It's going to be rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Which the book of Revelation starts off the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies. What do you think Revelation's doing to you right now? The revelation of the word and the understanding of what's going on and the revelation that brought you understanding is already lifting your head up above your enemies because you understand what they don't understand. You see what they see. You're in a different place. And revelation has lifted your head up above your enemies. Amen. Lifted up my, and now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Amen. He's singing and rejoicing while the company's gathering around him to eat up his flesh. Because why? He's the light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Hallelujah. It's easy to say that when nothing's going wrong. It's easy to say that when there's not armies camping around to destroy you. But when the, when the enemy gathers in and the, and, the, and the enemy camps and the armies come to war against you and gather around you, when you can still say, whom shall I fear? He is the light in my salvation. He is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That's when the rubber meets the road. That's when we get to the goods. Amen. Hallelujah. If we could go... I guess it's already up. All right, I titled this, The Dispensational Change in the Laodicean Church Age. We've been talking about this subject for quite a time and hitting it from a lot of different angles. So I want to go into it this way and see how it goes. Hey, I got a clicker. I like these things. Hey, it works. In the message, The Rapture, now we find here that Enoch was the seventh from Noah, which was a type of the church ages. Now all the rest of the six men before him died, but Enoch was translated. Enoch was raptured, the seventh, showing that it's the seventh church age that takes the rapture. Now there's no doubt we're in the seventh church age. We all know it. Now it's the seventh church age that takes the rapture. 
And I want you to lock in on that. It's the seventh church age that takes the rapture. And, and what I want to do, and we've tried to do it many, many times, but I hope to do it again today. I hope that when we use this terminology that in the seventh age, they take the rapture. I hope that we can go to the place where when we say rapture from now on, we don't immediately think of the translation and the change of the body, but we think of the rapture as the period of time, amen, when the bride begins to be caught up first by spiritual revelation and then by a change in the body amen. through a shout, a voice, and a trump. And that way when you begin to understand the prophet, when you begin to understand what he's saying and what he's doing, and, and we're going to show these things and prove that what I tell you is what the prophet taught and what he says, the, the end of the rapture or the final moment of the rapture is the change of the body. You're going to absolutely physically have a change in the body. And in the church ages book, Brother Branham said he'll change your atoms. You're going to have a change on the molecular level. That old hybrid genetics is going to be changed, amen? But until that point, you're going to be changing and changing and changing and changing and changing to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we're looking at the tail end of the church ages here. We're going to focus back in this area with a, with a graphic here in a minute, but first I want to read out of the first seal. Then along comes the Pentecostal age with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they cabbage down on that. Now, there cannot be no more ages. That's all of it. That's the Philadelphia or not. That's the Laodicean age. But then we found in the studying of the Scripture that the messenger to the age come right at the end of the age every time. The end of the age. So the messenger to the age come right at the end of the age every time. Paul come at the end of the age. We find out that Irenaeus come at the end of the age. Martin end of the age. Luther the end of the Catholic age. Wesley at the end of the Luther age. So what's he showing here? Luther at the end of the Catholic age. Luther come at the end of the previous age. He come to close down the Catholic age or close down Thyatira and move the church into the Lutheran age or the start of the Reformation. So he came at the end. When he says he come at the end of the age, he come at the end of the previous age. Luther started the Lutheran age, and after he died, it continued on for quite some time. Then he says, and what? Wesley at the end of the Lutheran age. So when he says the messenger come at the end of the age, he's saying the messenger comes at the end of the previous age. Luther at the end of the Catholic age, Wesley at the end of the Lutheran age, and Wesley started the Wesleyan age. That's why it's called the Wesleyan age. And he come to close down one and transition into another. And Pentecost at the end of the age of sanctification through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And at the end of the Pentecostal age, we are supposed to receive, according to the word, as God helped me tonight to show you through here, that we are to receive a messenger that will take all those loose ends out there and reveal the whole secret of God for the rapturing of the church. Amen. So at the end of the Pentecostal age, not at the beginning, at the end, there comes a messenger to close out the Pentecostal age and move us into what? Into the rapturing of the church. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, see, one thing that we can't do is we can't use old denominational, traditional understanding of terminology. Let the prophet define the terms. Don't let the old seminary education and the old understanding define the terms, but let the prophet define what the end of an age is. Let the prophet tell us what rapturing time is. In the message, the rapture, he says, now watch. Now in the seventh church age, when the seventh angel begins to sound, the mysteries of God was to be made known right there, the seals. Revelations 10, 7, what is that? That's the opening of the seals, which was the preaching of the seven thunders. Hallelujah. So when does that happen? At the end of the age. 
He tells us over and over. I, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of quotes on this, but I'm trying just to hit the highlights here. So we got three dates I want to look at. 1906, 1963, and 2018. And we want to look at the messenger coming to the end of the age. Now, we know Brother Branham came, amen, and, and his ministry started, and, and, and he was preaching after his first revival. He was baptizing in the Ohio River, and, and in 1933, we know Pillar of Fire came down and gave him his commission as a forerunner to the second coming of Christ. That's another term that you have to be careful when you talk about the second coming of Christ. We have to remember the second coming of Christ ends with the meeting in the air. It doesn't start with the meeting in the air. It starts with a shout and a voice and a trumpet. Amen. The coming of the Lord is the bride coming. Coming in bride form. The Son of Man coming in flesh to the flesh of his church. Says it so many ways. So that's another term we can't use a traditional seminary understanding. The second coming is not the pinprick moment in time when we meet him in the air. That's the conclusion. That's the end of the second coming. Hallelujah. So now, from, now he says at the end of the age, and when the ages are over, he says all kinds of different ways that messenger is going to be here. So we find out from 1906 to 1963, that's 57 years, and from 63 to 2018 is 55 years. So if we're still traveling on in the last age, in the Pentecostal age, if we're still moving on in that, then Brother Benham did not come at the end of the age. He came in the middle of the age. So th this cannot be the Pentecostal age. This has to be a different age. This can't be the end of the church ages. We've got to, that has to have ended because what the prophet told us. He told us it would end. Praise the Lord. Satan's Eden, he said, that Laodicean church age is the Pentecostal church age. Because it's the last church age. Luther had his message. Wesley had his message. And Pentecost had their message. So Brother Branham is tying the Pentecostal age and the Laodicean church age together. He says there's multiple times that, that the last age is the Pentecostal age, that the Pentecostal age is the Laodicean church age. He says it many different ways. But I'm going to show you another quote that I hope is going to bring some clarity to this because we understand that the Laodicean church age continues on. It continues on all the way to the tribulation period. And so, look at what the prophet says here in 1965, doors and doors. He said, remember this Pentecostal is speaking to the Pentecostal age is the last age. All right, that wasn't the quote I wanted. I lost my punchline. But it's coming, hold on. So the Pentecostal age is the last age. And the Laodicean church age is the Pentecostal age. Is that right? All right, let's look at this. Now we see there's, there's a transition from the Philadelphian church age ends in 1906 and the Laodicean church age begins. But Brother Branham says something in the Philadelphian church age that's very interesting. He says, in order to understand the wealth of meaning involved in, behold, I set before you an open door and no man can shut it, we must now recall that what has been said about each age running over into another age there is an overlapping, a melting, or fading into rather than an abrupt and a clear-cut start. The, this age particularly, this age particularly, the sixth age, flows into the next age. This is important to understand. The Philadelphian age, this age particularly flows into the next age or the seventh age or the, Phila or the Laodicean age. And not only does this age overflow into the last age, but the last age in many respects simply is simply a carrying on of the sixth age. Now this is strange the way he says it, but I'm going to show you why, why he says it here in a minute. He goes on to say the seventh age, a very short age, gathers up into itself for one quick work all the evil of every age and yet all the reality of Pentecost. Once the Phil Philadelphian age has about run its course, the Laodicean age quickly comes in, bringing both the tares and the wheat to harvest. So let's just look at this for a minute. 
So we know that the Pentecostal age comes in, Brother Bram tells us in 1906, and, and he tells that the seventh age, the sixth age is really, particularly more than any other age, flowing into the next age. And you could say, this is what he says, but in, in the last age is in many respects simply a carrying on of the sixth age. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why. Because the seventh age or the Pentecostal age starts with no messenger. It starts in 1906 and there's no messenger. And the messenger doesn't start his ministry until 1933. So in many ways, amen, the, the sixth age just flows into the seventh age because the seventh age or the Pentecostal age starts with no messenger. This is why Brother Bram says many times that the Holy Ghost is the, is the messenger to the seventh church age because there was an outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the gifts were restored back into the church in 1906 and continued on. But Brother Branham comes at the end of the age. The end of what age? The end of the Pentecostal age. Hallelujah. The evening messenger, he says, but let me tell you, there will rise a messenger at the end of the Pentecostal age and wind up the thing, it'll be a man. So this is why Brother Branham's saying this age is flowing into and that the seventh in many respects is simply carrying on of the sixth. And if we go to Revelation chapter 3, let's go there together. I didn't have this in my notes, but I just feel like going and taking a look at it here real quick. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 11. After he's given them admonition, he's given them some instruction. He comes to verse 11 and he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold thou fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He's in the sixth age. And in the sixth age, he's saying, Behold, I come quickly. But I didn't think he came in the sixth age. I thought he came in the seventh age. The sixth age flows into the seventh age. And the seventh age is a very short age, amen, and, and the prophet of the seventh age comes on the scene to close out the Pentecostal age and bring us into another age or another dispensation, and that's, Brother Branham points to this scripture and shows that this one's just flowing into the other one, and he's saying, behold, I come quickly. Is he talking about coming in 2018 or 2019, or is it another coming that he's talking about? It says here, in God hiding himself in simplicity, I believe the Laodicean age is the Pentecostal age, where she comes to the place of lukewarm and God spews her from his mouth. And this is the quote I was wanting earlier. But believing that this is one of the last great revivals that the world will receive, and it's come in the last age, the Laodicean age, the end of the Pentecostal dispensation. So within the Laodicean age, there's a Pentecostal dispensation. And at the end of the Pentecostal dispensation, there's a messenger that comes in to end the Pentecostal dispensation, and it takes place in Laodicea. Yeah. All right, keep moving. So then in 1963, something happens. Something happens because there's a prophet down to close out the Pentecostal age. And, and if you're closing out an age, when the messenger comes to close out an age, he's here to move the people to something else. When Luther was closing out the Catholic age, he was moving them to something else. When Wesley was closing out the Lutheran, moving them to something else. And now Brother Branham is here closing out the Pentecostal age and moving us to something else. But he can't be moving us to another church age because the Pentecostal age is the seventh age and it's the last church age, so he can't be moving us to another church age. But he's got to be moving us to something else. And he says, and then there's coming forth seven mysterious thunders that's not even written at all. That's right. And I believe that through these seven thunders will be revealed in the last day in order to get the bride together for rapturing faith. 
Because what we got right now, we, would, we wouldn't be able to do it. There's something we've got to step farther. We can't have enough faith for divine healing hardly. We've got to have enough faith to change in a moment and be swept up out of the earth. Praise God. So, so Brother Branham is here at a dispensational change, changing from Pentecost to something else. Pentecost is that Laodicean church age, the last one. It's going to take us to something else. And there's something significant that takes place in his life, and he starts to talk about it at the end of 1962 when he sees the vision of the pyramid coming down or the capstone or the headstone. Who is the headstone? Christ. Christ is the headstone. So he sees the headstone coming. He sees the capstone coming. And, and, and now that capstone coming is going to be a, a revelation of the seven thunders or a revealing of the word because the stone is revelation. Hallelujah. And, and the question I have, well, let's go read Revelation chapter 3, and then I'll maybe ask my question. Revelation 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me, will sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and sit down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we find out here is that, that great terrible scripture where he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. And we talked about this the previous Sunday, where, where, or two Sundays back, where Brother Branham said they completely put him outside the church. Now you see Christ on the outside of the Laodicean church age. Christ put out in the last church age. And, and so we see he's, he's out of the camp. He's out of the church. He's not in the church anymore. But then we come to verse 4, and it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So we preached on two doors at the end of the church ages because we have a closed door in the Laodicean church age, and he's standing knocking at the closed door. And who closed the door? The church has closed the door and put him on the outside. But then there was a door open in heaven, and you're looking, at the open door. Amen. The door was open in heaven because heaven is consisted of the word and there was an open word. The third pool took place in 1963 when the fullness of the word came forth, the preaching of the seven thunders, the revealing of the seals. So now we see, we see this pyramid coming down, and we know, Brother Bram said, it's the seven angels, and the seven angels, what became his, their wings became his wig, showing that all the completeness of the seven church ages. He's showing that the seven church ages are complete, and now he comes down. Hallelujah. The question that I have is when this cloud comes down, and this constellation of angels moves over top the prophet, where does the prophet go? He goes up into the constellation of angels. What's he doing? He's the wave chief. He's showing us the way. There's been a door closed, but a door open in heaven, and when that constellation of angels come, he was lifted off the ground into the constellation of angels. Why? Because John's got to be caught up through the open door. Here's what he says. He says in, in the message, Perseverant, August 1963, I seen the rocks tumbling off the side of the hill, rolling down, and I looked up. There was the white circle above me there, circling around. Here come seven angels come moving down out of the air, picked me up and said, go back to your home to the east right away and bring those seven seals, for there are seven mysteries, for the complete word is revealed now in these seven mysteries. Amen. So when he saw it, he was caught up into it. Hallelujah. I love all the typology. I love the path that he has to go. It's very exciting to me. But, but now we know that this is the headstone, and we know that the cornerstone become the headstone. 
capping off the building, which is the church, and after the church ages are finished, after you've come up seven layers of the pyramid, now the headstone, now Christ, now the capstone can come down. And I want to take a diversion for a minute and go to Daniel chapter 2. If you can turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. I wasn't going to go this direction, but in the back I just started catching a little inspiration. I thought I'd look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Come to the time where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and none of the wise men can interpret the dream and it's this image and and now Daniel comes to give him the interpretation and in chapter 2, verse 31, he says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest tell that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, the, the, the smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Hallelujah. I want to read a quote for you, if I can find it here. I just pulled it up. He says in the Jubilee year, 1954, he says, now prophecy repeats itself. Do you know the words of God repeat runs in cycles? For instance, one time scripture I read over there was trying to run a marginal reading all down through the Bible where it said, in Matthew's second chapter, first chapter I believe, said, where where it was fulfilled of the Lord by the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. Talking of Jesus being called of Egypt was referring to when God called Israel, for Israel was his son. And the scriptures that Matthew was referring to was the very scripture that he called his son Israel out of Egypt. He also called his son Jesus out of Egypt. Now, this is something that's important to to realize that prophecy runs in a cycle. And just because you see the the cycle run a full cycle, just like in the first Exodus when he said, I will call Israel out of, his Exodus said, I'll call Jacob out of Egypt, that ran in a full cycle. He came, he sent Moses, his prophet, he said, I've come down to deliver them and I'm sending you. Moses goes down on behalf of God, he delivers them out, they come out of Egypt and they go into the promised land. That cycle of prophecy completed. But that didn't mean the word is not still eternal and that there cannot be another cycle of the same exact prophecy. And we got to realize this. Prophecy runs in cycles. And Brother Bram said there's also natural and spiritual fulfillments. So just because you see a cycle doesn't mean it's over. So now this prophecy is also going to run in cycles. Now there's a mountain that is cut out, a stone that is cut out of the mountain without hands. And that stone is going to smite the image on its feet, amen? And that image is Gentile world powers, and the Gentile world powers has come down, amen, from Nebuchadnezzar, head of gold, to the Medes and the Persians, amen, to the Greeks, and and down into the, the thighs and the legs of iron, and then goes down in iron mixed with clay, and we're told that this empire, this fourth empire, intermingles itself with humanity, amen, and, it, and it, it becomes a church, and that church intermingles itself throughout all the world into humanity, and then we find out at the end it comes to ten toes. And Brother Branham comes, and he tells us that there's a time where these two feet were down into the feet because he tells us about a time when there's five nations of the east and five nations of the west are facing off and you have Eisenhower and you have Khrushchev and they're the two big toes on these two feet. And Eisenhower means iron and Khrushchev means clay. And Brother Branham is showing you we have come to the feet of the image. That doesn't mean there still won't be ten toes that are destroyed in the tribulation period. 
But he's showing you we've come to the age of ten toes. And he says, God so wanted you to see it that when Khrushchev got angry, he didn't beat his fist in the pulpit. He didn't beat his hat on the pulpit. He took off his shoe and took his shoe and he began to beat it on the podium. Brother Branham said to draw attention to the feet. Because he wanted us to see we've come to a fulfillment of Scripture. Now, these world powers have come out to east and west. Five kings here, five kings there. You can change the name of the kings all you want afterwards, but it's still five kings here and five kings there. Represented in Khrushchev and Eisenhower, iron and clay, giving a mark to the believers that we've come to the feet. And after we come to the feet, guess what happened? Down come a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And that stone smote the image in the feet. What is it? It's a spiritual revelation of the word that come to defeat the work of the Antichrist through the Gentile powers that went from pagan Rome to papal Rome and became a church system and became a spiritual movement in through the people. So now there's a spiritual stone come to smite a spiritual work in the feet. Now, will there be a natural destruction of the kings of the world? Absolutely. But we've come to the time where he showed us we've come to the feet and there's been a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, a tremendous revelation of Jesus Christ and he's come down himself and he smote this image and broke the power of the enemy. And you're the benefactor of the king coming down. This stone is a king. And what did the king do? He came to destroy the world powers and he came to start his kingdom upon the earth. Let's go down to verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh the pieces and subdueth all the things, and as iron that breaketh all things, shall it break the pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken." And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Wait a minute. In the days of these kings, did Brother Branham tell us we came to the days of these kings? Did he tell us there was two big toes on the feet, Eisenhower and Khrushchev, and that God had him take off his shoe and beat it to draw attention to the feet? Was this just a little story? Was this a whimsical antidote? Or was he showing us we've come to the time of the end of this dispensation of deception that's been deceiving the people through a church system, amen, that's become the Catholic system that is, as, uh, that is the whore with harlots and an ingram inter- intermingled itself amongst men. But when all the denominations, the Catholic Church, and all of it gets set up, there's a power. There's a stone. There's a revelation. There's the word that's going to cut out of a mountain without hands that will come down. It says, in the days of these kings, what kings? The ten toes. All we have to do is believe what the prophet said. We don't have to figure it out. When he said, those are the two big toes, they're the two big toes. When he said five from the east, five from the west, the ten kings, he meant it. That doesn't mean there'll not be another fulfillment in the tribulation period, but he knew what he was talking about, and he meant it. We just have to believe him. Hallelujah. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king 
what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. That stone smote the feet and grew into a mountain that filled the whole earth. What was it? A spiritual kingdom. The king come down looking for his queen. What's he come to do? He's come to start his kingdom. He's got, to lift, he's got to lift the kingdom off the earth, which the kingdom is in you. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is in you. Amen. Say not here and there, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. Is that what Jesus said? He come down. Where did the headstone go when he came down? He went into his bride. Amen. The capstone coming of the Lord, the second coming, the coming in flesh. What's he doing? Establishing a kingdom. And that kingdom has grown into a mountain that fills the whole earth. Not with a great number of people, but with a revelation that breaks the power of the enemy. And now, in order to come into physical manifestation, he's got to lift it off the earth and sweep it clean and bring it back down, amen, in a natural way. But that doesn't mean it's not here spiritually taking place right now. That doesn't mean that that stone that come out of the mountain without hands has not smitten that image in its feet. And now we're no longer under deception. We're no longer tricked by that, by that power that mingled itself into the people. That's been broken. Praise God. Amen. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. We might read it, we might not, but I just want to turn there. Then I'm going to go a little further in my slides. So the messenger comes at the end of the age. So if he came to end the age, what happened next? Because we said every Every messenger comes at the end of the age to close out the previous age and bring the people into a greater revelation or a new age. And we know that he's a forerunner like John the Baptist, and John the Baptist came in a breach. And in the breach, he came to stand in between two dispensations. He came to stand in between the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of grace. And he was the link that linked the two together. He was the last of the prophets of the Old Testament, bringing in the first of the New Testament prophets, which is Jesus Christ. He's the greatest prophet. He's all the prophets. He's everything all together. So he's here spanning the gap between the old and the new. What is Brother Branham here doing? He's standing here at the end of the dispensation of the church ages, and he's here to introduce us to the bridegroom. He's here to connect the head with the body, the bridegroom with the bride, so that we can come to the marriage of the Lamb. Amen. Same thing. Keeps repeating. See, these prophecies run in cycles. Keeps repeating. And so now, Brother Branham, his ministry comes and ends the, the Pentecostal age and brings in the Bride Age. Now, oh, there's so much I want to say. I'll just, I'll try to say it here. And just bear with me, because I'm just, I'm just going to share my heart, because I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm just going to talk to you. Wednesday night, and I love you all, and I'm glad to be home, and I, I just wish I could sit down in a chair here and we'd just talk. Get around the table and talk. The Pentecostal age, what is the Pentecostal age? What was the Lutheran age? The Lutheran age took place inside the Sardisian age. And you look in your church age book, it's called the Sardisian church age. But Brother Brennan calls it the Lutheran age. Then the next is the Philadelphian church age, but Brother Branham calls it the Wesleyan church age. So what is the Lutheran church age inside the Sardisian church age? The Lutheran church age is the calling out of the elect seed in that age. 
And the elect seed comes into the Lutheran age, into the revelation that was preached by Luther, and that is the elect seed moving through. But now there's a time for a dispensational change, so God sends another messenger down in John Wesley, and John Wesley is here not to bring one one earthly age into another earthly age, that's going to happen, but he's here to move the elect seed from the Lutheran age up to a higher revelation of the Wesleyan age, and that's what he's there to do, and now it's the calling out of the elect seed in that age. So what is the Pentecostal age? The Pentecostal age is in the Laodicean church age. And the brother Bram said, it is the Laodicean church age. The conditions match and everything at the end. But what is the Laodicean church age? It is the calling out of the elect predestinated seed in that age. So with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the restoration of the gifts in 1906, the elect seed of God moved up into that higher revelation and moved beyond Luther, moved beyond Wesley, and came in to the dispensation of the Pentecostal age. And they were sealed by a genuine seal of the Holy Ghost. Just like Luther was sealed, the Lutheran group was sealed, the Wesleyan group was sealed, and now the Pentecostal group is sealed, and they're called out, the elect is called out in the Pentecostal age. Now, when Brother Branham comes to end the Pentecostal age, we know that physically, we're still in Laodicea. Laodicea continues on into tribulation, but he comes at the end of the age, but the end of the age for what? Not the end of the age for time upon the earth. That ends in tribulation. But he comes at the end of the age for the calling out of the elect predestinated seed. Now there's no more sealing in the Pentecostal revival. There's no more sealing taking place under the Pentecostal revelation. Now you've got to go up into the revealed word at the preaching of the seven thunders, into the bride age. And what is the bride age? The bride age is taking place concurrent with the Laodicean church age. Not in the Laodicean church age, but concurrent to or at the same time as the Laodicean church age. That's why you hear Somebody could come into the Pentecostal age, even while Brother Branham was on the scene preaching and having revivals, and they could get sealed by a genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost in the Pentecostal age, amen, and never see the message. That's why Brother Branham, there's certain, uh, there's certain uh, testimonies that you hear people give. This one man, he said, Brother Branham, do you talk to my father? I'm worried about my father. He doesn't see the message. Brother Branham said, he's all right. He's sealed under a previous age. Now remember, Brother Branham said, every age laps into the other age. So now there's, been, there, there's people that are being called out and sealed in the bride age, and there's people who have been previously sealed under the Pentecostal revival, and after there's a transition that takes place, and now there's an open word, the third pull. Now the elect seed of God move into the third pull, the open word, the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, amen, the bridegroom, the headstone, they move into the fullness of the word, amen, and now that's where the sealing place is taking place. But that doesn't mean those people who were, not, who were sealed in the previous age just die and fall away. They never see this, but they're not part of the bright age. They weren't meant to see it. They live on, still sealed, because once you're sealed, you're sealed until the day of your redemption. And as long as they don't reject the bride, they don't reject the truth, they cannot understand it and still move on for a period of time, living in the Laodicean church age, having been sealed before the dispensational change. That's why Brother Bram would make those comments multiple times and says, that's okay, they're in a previous age. They're fine, don't worry about him, he's okay. Why, he was sealed under the Pentecostal age. Brother Bram understood these things. But don't try to get sealed under a Pentecostal age today. It's not gonna work. And those true elect seed have been dying off. But that doesn't mean there's no more sealing taking place. Because now we're not coming, and I'll say it this way, and my terminology is not going to be exactly right, but just pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm not trying to preach anything wrong, just listen to me. We're not trying 
to get a seal that'll carry us to our day of redemption. I'm not saying anything wrong with this. I'm not changing what the prophet said. But in previous ages, they needed a seal that would seal them, that would seal their soul and carry them to the day of redemption. We're not looking for a seal. We're looking for the one who gives the seal. We're looking for the husband, for the bride to be united with the bridegroom in a marriage and in an invisible union and the spiritual union of Christ and his church now in the marriage of the lamb now, and that is your seal. We're not just looking for a Pentecostal seal. I spoke in tongues and I had this this thing and I'm sealed to, no, I'm not looking just for an experience. I'm not looking for a seal. Now I'm looking for a person. I'm looking for my mate and my mate is the one who does the sealing. He's the one who inspects the box car. He's the one who puts the seal on the outside. I'm not just looking for the inspector. I'm married to the inspector. It's a different dispensation. It's not like the previous. We've come to a marriage. We've come, we've come to the time when you can be united with the one who gives the seal. Amen. Hallelujah. I hope they didn't throw you for a loop, but it's the truth Amen. nonetheless. So now the elect have to come out of Laodicea because you've got to go into the bride age. And the bride age is not another church age because you can't have an eighth church age. Laodicea is the last church age. The Pentecostal age is the Laodicean church age, but the messenger comes at the end of the Pentecostal age. All these statements are true. Now the Laodicea just trucks right on through and goes into outer darkness, complete chaos, and is black, totally blacked out, no light whatsoever. And Christ is not there. According to the scriptures, he's not there. So now you've got to come out and be united with him. What is it when you come out and you're united with him? You're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not another age, an eternal position. Stepping into eternity. While time is still here, while you still wake up to an alarm clock, while you still punch a clock for work, you've actually stepped into an eternal realm because the internal word is open. And if you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, there's a part of you that is not subject to the time clock anymore. There's a part of you that has moved beyond time, moved beyond punching the clock, moved beyond needing a wake-up call. There's a part of you that is seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Hallelujah. Brother Benham said, when God's people begins to gather back together, this is from 1959. I thought it was super interesting. When God's people begins to gather back together, there's unity, there's power. He is not talking about an ecumenical move. He is dead set against ecumenicism. So he's not talking about coming together just to come together. There's got to be a certain coming together, and only the word can bring them together. There's a unity, there's a power, and whenever God's people gets together completely, I believe the resurrection will take place then. There'll be a rapturing time. Now listen, listen close. There'll be a rapturing time when the Holy Spirit begins to gather it up. So the rapturing time he's not, he's talking about is when the Holy Spirit begins to gather what? The bride. Begins to gather it up into one to bring it into a unity under the word, under the capstone, in the capstone, bringing the bride together. So when he says the rapturing time, Brother Branham is not referring to only the change of the body. He's referring to the time when the Holy Ghost begins to gather it up. That's the rapturing time. That's the bride age. It'll be in the minority, of course, but there'll be a great gathering. A great gathering where? In Arizona? In Jeffersonville? A great gathering in the Word. A great gathering in Christ. 
1965, God's only provided place of worship. And remember, remember how we just went through the church ages. The messenger to the church always comes just at the dying of the other church age. Oh, my goodness. Brother Branham came at the dying of the other church age. It's dying. It's dead. How do you know Laodicea is dead? There's no light. Total blackout. Completely dark. Now, listen. The dying of the Pentecost brings forth the rapturing of the bride. Now he comes at the dying of the previous age. So when did he come? 1933. When did he leave? 1965. When were the seals open? 1963. He come at the dying of the Pentecostal age, but at the dying of the Pentecostal age brings forth the rapturing of the bride. He left the scene in 1965. And the dying of that, that dispensational change, was supposed to bring the bride into a rapture. I say to you, it did. The dying of the Pentecost brings forth the rapturing of the bride. Hold on to that phrase. The dying of Luther brought forth Wesley. The dying of Wesley brought forth Pentecost. The dying of Pentecost brings forth the message now. Now I'm going to read those two statements back to back and watch the wording. The dying of Pentecost brings forth the rapturing of the bride. The dying of Pentecost brings forth the message now. What is the message now? The rapturing of the bride. Same phrase, same terminology, same thing. The true message with the true revelation of the genuine message brings the rapturing of the bride. When? In the time when the Holy Ghost begins to bring it together. Not when you go home, when he begins to bring it together. The rapture comes with a shout, with a voice, and with a trump. What is the shout? The message to gather the people together. What is it? It's the start of the rapture. It is the bride age. Hallelujah. Now we find out that now we find our Pentecostal brethren are living in the glare of Pentecostal age and they still miss it. They're trying to interpret the Pentecostal age when we're plumb past that. 1964, Brother Benham said, we're plumb past that. We're living on up to the rapturing time for the coming of the end time. We're past the Pentecostal time. We're already plumb up in the rapturing time. 1965, this is just a couple weeks before Brother Branham's in a car accident. We're not living in a Pentecostal age. We're living in another age. We're not living in a Methodist age. We're living in another age. We're living on up here to the bride age. The calling out of the church and getting it together for the rapture. What is the bride age? The, the calling out of the church. Calling out of what? Calling out of dead denominationalism. Calling out of the Laodicean church age. Calling out of the chaos that the church is going into and getting them together for the rapture. What calls them and gets them together? The shout. What is the shout? The message. And Brother Branham said when that seventh church age messenger begins to sound, amen, his message, not back there in the healing campaigns, but when he begins to reveal the word. Under the third pool, that's the message, the third pool, which is the opening of the word. What is that doing? It's calling out the shout. It's calling out the church and getting it together for a rapture. The shout is the start of the rapture. That's the age that we're now living. To my honest opinion, that's exactly the truth. What a time it is that we're living in. Something like a calendar. You look at the calendar to find out what day you're living in. You look at God's Bible to see what age we're living in. We're not living in the Methodist age, the Baptist age. We're living in the bride age, the calling bringing back to God through a channel that he promised to bring it back in. Amen. Hallelujah. We're living up in the bride end. We've entered into the calling out time, into the channel that's bringing us back to God. Message Jehovah Jireh. And the church has come. Look how it's come up through justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and now right into the rapturing time. See how many times he's saying this? 
That's why our terminology in our mind has to change. When, he's, when we say the rapture of the church, amen, we can't only think of the catching away and the meeting in the air. We've got to go all the way back and start thinking about when the rapturing time began. What was it when the Holy Ghost went forth to gather it together under what? Under the shout, under the message, which was what? The third pull. Not the first two pulls, the third pull, which is the opening of the word, which, which came down. When you see that cloud, what is it? It's the mighty angel coming down. It's the sign, the symbol of the mighty angel coming down. Christ himself to what? To bring back the full revelation of the word. To do what? To shout. To call together all the elect. Not in Laodicea, not in the Pentecostal age, but out of that. Into what? Into the rapture. When you look at the Laodicean condition in Revelation chapter three, the Laodicean believer says, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. I am. It's a self-determination not a scriptural determination, but a self-determination. Determining what I am, declaring, a self-declaration. I am rich, increased with good, and have need of nothing. Now, the spiritual and scriptural explanation or determination or description is that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. There's a big difference. When we get to the Laodicean church age, we've come to the peak of deception. That deceiving Antichrist spirit has worked and worked and worked and worked until it can get to a church that is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and knoweth it not. So deceived and so blinded by the lies of the devil that when they're in this condition of miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked, that they would say, I am rich and I am creased with goods and I have need of nothing. Blinded by the lies of the enemy in total darkness because there is no light left in that age. And then Christ is pushed to the outside of that. He's not in that, he's outside of that. So Christ is going to come in a son of man ministry at the end of the church ages, and what's he going to do? He's going to work in and through flesh. In the flesh of his church, it's the bride coming of Christ. He can't go into that. So she's gotta come out of that and go into him and he into her. Hallelujah. Is Laodicean still going on? Yep. But not for me. Amen. I've entered into the rapture through the shout. I heard the shout. It gathered me together to the word. Amen. The Eliezer ministry has united the bridegroom with the bride. Me. Has united the headstone with the body. Me. I've been united. I've been united with the one who gives the seal. I've been united with the one who is the word. We've been tied back together. Amen. And now I'm not in Laodicea. I'm not in a Laodicean condition. I'm not in darkness. I'm not poor, miserable, blind, wretched, or naked. I've been caught out into a place where I've been clothed in the word. I've got the wedding garment of the word that's been put on me, and I'm dwelling in the light. Why? Because I've come into the rapture. And because I've come into the rapture, I'm going in the rapture. <laughs> oh, praise God. See, the deception of the devil is to try to always get us to look back on what God has done, look forward on what he will do, and not recognize what's happening right now. Any time somebody will say, you know, there's nothing going on right now, we're waiting for the rapture, and we're between dispensations, and we've come out of this waiting for the rapture, that's a deception from the devil because the devil's trying to get you to look back and look forward and miss what's happening right now. Hallelujah. Churches come 
Look how it's come up through justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and now right into the rapturing time to get the church ready. What? The rapturing time is not to take them away. They've come into the rapturing time to get them ready. (laughs) Have you come into the rapturing time? Are you getting ready? Amen is the rapture. Amen is the rapturing time is the bright age. Getting you ready for the change of the body. Getting you ready for the catching away. Is it catching you away to the catching away? Is it raising you up to the raising up? Amen. And and right now into the rapturing time. Are we in the rapturing time? To get the church ready. Just exactly the way it promised. Just the way the church ages are lying. So the church has come up through justification, Luther, sanctification, Wesley, baptism of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. But he said, and now, something past Pentecost. The church has come up through justification, Luther, sanctification, Wesley, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Pentecost. That's all past. And then he makes a statement, and now. What is and now? Something else besides what we mentioned. And now right into the rapturing time, which is the bright age. So the age ended when the messenger was here. How many believe that? No more elect being called out of the Pentecostal age. The ones who are elect and sealed there, they can carry through and begin to die natural deaths. That's fine. That's not the rapturing crowd. Those were never intended to be in the rapturing crowd. That's why God has allowed time to continue on, possibly, to let those sealed under the Pentecostal seal begin to die off because they weren't intended to move into the rapturing time because the rapturing time started with the shout. And what did the shout do? It came to call us out, call us out of Laodicea into the bride age, which was what? The gathering together and getting ready for the rapture. The rapturing time, getting the church ready. Then at the end of this period of time, we get the body change. The bride age or the rapturing time moves into the body change. And at the same time, Laodicea goes into tribulation. That's why there can't be another church age. There can't be, uh, there can't be another church age And Laodicea has to continue on into the tribulation period. But I'm no longer subject to Laodicea. I've been called out through a shout. 1963, the token. Today is the calling out of the bride, out of the church, the exodus for the rapture. For the church truly goes through the tribulation period as you Pentecostal brothers have preached it. I believe that. The church goes through it, but not the bride. No, sir. The Laodicean church goes through the tribulation period. Not the bride. Why? She's already been caught up. She's already been called out. She's already been lifted out of dead denomination. She's already been resurrected out of that condition and brought up. Arise and shine, for thy light has come. The glory of the Lord has shined upon thee. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Brother Joe, if you can make your way up. Praise God, friends. The days of waiting for fairy dust to fall out of the sky are over. The power is already here. The word's already been restored. We are all the ingredients have already been given to the church. Everything we need for the body change is already here. We're walking in the rapturing time, caught up out of dead denomination, caught into the rapturing of the church, and it's going to end with the translation of the body in the meeting in the air. I don't know about you, but I'm happy. 
I saw that stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And I saw him come down through a prophetic ministry and smash that image in its feet. And now no power of a denomination, no power of a church, no false teaching is going to hold God's children anymore. They have been liberated. They have been freed because the stone has come down and smashed the image in its feet. And all the wickedness of the Antichrist spirit has been destroyed and blown as chaff. And now that mountain has started to grow. That stone has started to grow into a mountain. What mountain? Mount Zion, which is the bride on earth. Where are you at in Mount Zion? I've been liberated. I've been free. All the powers, the denominational powers of this world can't hold me anymore. Can't deceive me, can't trick me, can't blind me, can't strip me of my clothes, can't take away any of my goods because I'm in a different jurisdiction now. The queen has united with the king. And now no power, no earthly power, no spiritual force can touch her anymore. The kingdom has begun. Hallelujah. Let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it's so rich to us, Lord. We just keep going over and over and over the same things, Lord. You keep taking us higher and opening our eyes to see more. Lord, we pray that you would take us all the way to a full, complete revelation of your word. You've already given the revelation, but open our eyes to see. Give us the greater understanding that we seek to know you in a better way than we've ever known you before. We thank you for what you've done, and we just pray that you'd come now, Lord, and that you would lift us higher, that you would forgive us, Lord, for where we've let down the bar, Lord, and bring us back into that perfect fellowship with you that we so desire. Lord, I love you. If there's anybody here whose eyes have not been opened and they're stuck in a Laodicean condition, I pray, Lord, that through the shout, you'd bring them out right now. That they would hear the shout, Lord. That they would hear the word and they they would desire to come out to you, Lord, and leave that miserable condition of blindness, Lord, and, and, and miserableness and poverty, and they would come and join to the king. We love you, God. We thank you for what you've done for us. We give you all glory and honor and power. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you, saints. You know that song, I'm so glad Jesus set me free? Let's sing that song, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Not he's going to set me free. He's already set me free. Oh, I'm subject to this and I'm subject to that and I still get sick. Who told you you were subject to sickness? Who told you? That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says I've already been freed by Calvary, that there's a price that's already been paid, and that I'm healed by his stripes. Oh, I'm just subject to this, and I'm subject to that. I'm not subject to any of it, because the title deed has been put back in my hands, and in that title deed is a perfect body, and that title deed is a perfect mind, and that title deed is perfect fellowship. I'm no longer subject to the things of the world. I've just got to believe what's in the title deed, and I gotta believe that the judge has come down, the white-wigged one, to enforce my rights that I read in that book. Title deed's not a mystery. Brother Brandon said, this is the title deed. This is your inheritance letter. If you can read it in the book, you can have it. And guess what? The judge came down to make sure if you claim it, you get it. We're free. We should act like we're free. We're free. We should quit letting the devil have victories because he has no right anymore. This is God's redeemed property. It's not his property. This is the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. This is the habitation of God. This is a lively stone built into a spiritual tabernacle. He has no rights. I've been given all rights. And I don't intend to live as though I'm subject to all of his whims. I'm going to take my claim in the title deed, and then I'm going to ask the judge to enforce my rights, my title deed rights, and then I'm going to go free, and I'm going to rest and wait for the judge to bring it all to pass. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to try. I'm going to take my claim from the title deed book, and I'm going to rest and let the judge enforce it. Whatever time he sees fit, whatever way, but he's the enforcer, not me. 
I just take my claims. Hallelujah. Let's sing this song together. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. me. I'm so glad that Jesus lived with me. Singing glory, hallelujah, well, Jesus set me free. Well, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven and shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven and I'm shouting victory. Singing glory, Oh, Jesus set me free. Well, Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. Well, I'm so glad. I'm going to sing that again, but I like to look at that second verse. I'm on my way to heaven. What's that mean? I'm not going to take a traditional understanding of on my way to heaven because there's a part of me that's already there. You know what? In fact, my theophany was never not there. Because if we, this body of this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, I have one not made with hands, eternal, already waiting in the heavens. Amen. Part of me had never left that dimension. Amen. And when the, when the seed that was laying in my soul come awake, eternal life awakened within me. Amen. He in me and I in him. And I am seated now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Two thirds of my journey to heaven is done. Amen. Two thirds of my journey is finished. And this body is being moved up in the heavenly places step by step by step as the Holy Ghost takes control and forces this body to match that word. Amen. I'm nearly there, friends. I'm on my way, but I've crossed over. Amen. My soul has crossed over. My theophany has already crossed over. And I'm taking my last steps on earth until this body crosses over. Hallelujah. Let the message break our old understanding and give us a true understanding of where we are now. Not where we were, not where we're going to be, but where we are right now. Amen. God bless you. Let's sing this song with revelation. All right, God bless you, brother. Let's sing it again. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Yes, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. And I'm so glad that Jesus lived me. Yes, I'm so glad that Jesus lived me. I'm so glad that Jesus lived me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Well, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. On my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Well, Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. Hallelujah. You know why you're 
on your way to heaven shouting victory because I'm already there. It's not like I'm worried about my destination. My destination is sure. I've already been united with the one who gives the seal. I've already been united with the Lord of heaven and earth. I'm already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why am I shouting victory? Because I'm not worried about whether I'm gonna make it in the rapture or not. I've already made it into the rapture. The rapture's in me. I've stepped into it. I've been called out to the rapturing time in the shout. It's happening. That's why we can shout victory. It's because we have a promise that's sure and already working in our being. Satan had me bound. Bound by what? Not by sickness. Not by addictions. Not by lust of the flesh or lust of the eye or pride of life. He had us bound by creeds and dogmas. Because if you ever get free of creeds and dogmas, sickness and temptations and lust is no big deal. That's not how he bound the church. He didn't bind the church in sickness. He didn't bind it. He bound her in deception. And now in the evening time, by the evening time message, he's been loosed back into the church again. The Holy Spirit's not bound anymore. I'm not bound either by any kind of deception. Satan had me bound, amen. What freed me from my bondage, amen. Not because I got better, or not because, no, what freed me was the finishing of deception in my mind. And I realized by a revelation of who I really am and what the word is really saying. And now Satan has no hold on me. Revelation is what destroys the bonds of the enemy not grinding my teeth and buckling through and getting to healing, but the revelation of the word that has lifted me out of carnal thinking and denominational understanding and set me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus has erased my understanding and given me the mind of Christ and that has broke the deception and that has given me freedom from the bondage of Satan. And if you've come free from that bondage, then you're free from it all. There's nothing that can bind you anymore when you come to that level of freedom by the revelation of the word and moved into the shout. He can't bind you in sickness. He can't bind you in financial trouble. He can't bind you in your mind. He can't bind you with lust. He has no hold on you anymore because he only works through deception. I feel like singing it again. Let's sing it one more time, brother. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Yes, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus set me free. And I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Yes, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. Singing glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. Oh, Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. I'm singing glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. Well, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Yes, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. Yes, I'm so glad that Jesus set me free. I'm singing glory, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. Well, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm shouting victory. I'm on my way to heaven. 
I'm shouting victory. I'm singing glory. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. Oh, Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Oh, Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Oh, Satan had me bound. But Jesus set me free. Singing glory. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus set me free. And victory is mine. Yes, victory is mine. Yes, victory today is mine. Cause I told Satan to get me behind. Oh, victory today is mine. Oh, when I rose this morning, I didn't have no doubt. Cause I knew that the Lord would bring me out. So I got down on my knees. I said, Lord, help me please. And I rose up singing and shouting the victory. Oh, the Holy Ghost is mine. Holy Ghost is mine. The Holy Ghost today is mine. Cause I told Satan to get me behind. Oh, the Holy Ghost today is mine. Happiness is mine. Yes, happiness is mine. Happiness is mine. Well, happiness today is mine. Cause I told Satan to get thee behind. Oh, happiness today. When I rose this morning, when I rose this morning, I didn't have no doubt. Cause I knew that the Lord would bring me out. So I got down on my knees. I said, Lord, help me please. I rose up singing and shouting the victory. Oh, healing is mine. Yes, healing is mine. Oh, healing today is mine. Cause I told Satan to get thee behind. Oh, healing today. Perfect love is mine. Oh, is mine. Love is mine. Oh, love, today is mine. Cause I told Satan to be behind. Oh, love, today is mine. Oh, when I rose this morning, I didn't have no doubt. Cause I knew that my Lord could bring me out. So I got down on my knees. I said, Lord, help me please. I rose up singing and shouting the victory. Oh, because victory is mine. Yes, victory is mine. Yes, victory today. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I told Satan to get thee behind. Oh, victory today. Let's clap it. I said, Lord, help me please. And I rose up singing and shouting victory. Healing is mine. Yes, healing is mine. Yes, healing is mine. Healing today is mine. Oh, cause I told Satan to get me behind. Oh, healing today. Fellowship is mine. Yes, fellowship is mine. Yes, fellowship is mine. Fellowship today is mine. Oh, cause I told Satan to get thee behind. Oh, fellowship today is mine. Hallelujah. Victory is mine. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord.
sing this is the evening time key of heaven this is the evening time it's later than we think the bride is This is the evening time. It's later than we think. The bride is preparing now for her Lord to be. And all things are ready now. The bridegroom I hear. Let he that hath an ear to hear, evening time is here. 